Hey everybody, thanks for uh, joining. We're gonna get started here in just a, a few more minutes here right at the top of the hour. Um, so yeah, just go ahead and uh, settle in, grab a cup of coffee, stretch the legs and uh, get ready for this exciting uh, webinar. While we wait, Jason, any chance you could pass me the ball so um, so I can share my screen? I think you see if you just click the share button, it should uh, prompt you. Um, It'll, it'll stop the other person from sharing. So how do you like um, Hannele's artistic creation, Jason? Oh, by the way, Jason, you might be muted. Jason, Mr. Presenter, can you hear us? I hope we didn't lose Jason because we have like one minute to uh, to begin. Jerry, Jerry, can you hear me? I can hear you. Yeah. And Jason isn't force muted or anything like that, right? Uh, uh, there we go. He's back. Wait. Jason, you there? We could right here. Can you hear me? Can you hear me now? Now we can. Now we okay. can. Perfect. <laughs> okay. Yeah, a little uh, issue with the controls, but I think I got it now. All right. We still have two minutes. I was just asking, um, you know, making a conversation. How do you like uh, Hanele's, our marketing manager's uh, work of art here? I, I think it's brilliant. I actually set it up as my, my Twitter picture because it's just, just amazing. So she, she did some really nice work. She's awesome though, uh, but but I guess it started uh, by you sent some short uh, mesh based Shakespeare thing over to Hanele and me, right? When we were kind of planning this webinar and yes. then the whole idea. Yeah. Took yes, I sent, I, 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 you know, I had the idea for kind of to mesh or not to mesh as kind of a general topic. Um, and so I, I sent it along and to your marketing folks just to kind of feel them out and Next thing I know, everybody was running with it, and and she sends me this picture, and it's like, wow, that is so cool. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, that's, that's pretty cool. But you know, we were looking for a way of kind of introducing the topic that was catchy and would attract people and and be a little um, edgy, if you will, um, you know, and and something a little different to kind of attract people and get people's attention. So exactly. And that would be a good It turns time. out that Hamlet and Mesh are both tragedies. You know, there, there's kind of good synergy there. So. <laughs> okay, I'm I'm sure it's going to be an interesting webinar. So so we are at the top of the hour, and I guess it's uh, it's uh, time to start. Uh, so if the audience has any opinions on this kind of kind of marketing, keep it keep it coming. You can use the chat board or Q and A board or whatever we have in Zoom. Uh, I, I have no idea. But uh, Jerry, are you there? Should we kick things off? Absolutely. Yeah, I'm ready to get this ball rolling. This is going to be a good topic. All right. So just FYI, this webinar will be recorded and you will receive the link from our friendly folks at marketing in the coming days to your email. So if you'd rather go out and enjoy the sunshine, by all means, the web webinar recording will be all yours. Don't leave though. Don't <laughs> just don't.
<laughs> anyway, I, I, today, uh, Jerry, you're the one that kind of started this. Today we'll be using zoom.us and it's really yours and Joel's fault, isn't it? So we yeah, have used the well, webinar before, right? That's right. Yeah, I'll take take the blame for it if uh, if things fall off the rails too much on the uh, the technology side. But yeah, we're hoping this will uh, you know be an improvement, if anything, from uh, audio quality to, to video. So if you uh, have any issues or anything like that, definitely make sure to uh, utilize the, uh, the the chat function or the uh, the Q and A function and let us know. But uh, yeah, hopefully this will just greatly enhance your uh, overall experience. And to celebrate that, I have gotten a brand new Blue Yeti mic as well. So we'll see how it goes. Any comments on the audio quality, like Jerry said, video quality, anything, uh, let us know. Um, yeah, this is actually a screenshot from GoToWebinar, but I'm assuming uh, Zoom also has this QA functionality as well as a chat functionality. Does it have both or are they kind of integrated or how does this work? Literally, I opened Zoom for the first time like two minutes ago. That's, you know, that's how we do things around here. Yeah, really similar functionality if you've joined any of our previous uh, webinars before. So your, your lines are obviously muted and then you have the Q&A box there to locate. We also have the, uh, the chat uh, enabled to be able to speak directly with the panelists. Um, so feel, feel free to leverage those. Uh, but yeah, the, the q and A I'll be monitoring throughout the session here myself and UC and try to get those questions answered for you quickly. Great. Great. So um, today, our main presenter is Dr. Hintersteiner. Um, you, you, you have an intro slide about yourself later, or you want to say a couple of words now? You seem uh, to be in sync with me, whatever that means. Uh, I do have an intro slide a little later. All right. Um, but uh, yeah, I'm CWNE number 171. Uh, I've been very active in the CWNP community, which is how I know UC and Jerry and a whole bunch of other folks at Echo. Um, and I'm really looking forward to doing this webinar today. Thank you so much, Jason, for doing it. It's, it's a pleasure. And this has been a long time coming. So, so uh, you, you know, glad to finally uh, find time from your, from your and our schedules to make this happen. My name, is Jus My name is Jussi. I uh, do marketing stuff product stuff, everything kind of stuff here at Ekahau. Actually, today I ruined our new $3,000 coffee machine. So, so you, you know, that seems to be one of those janitorial duties. Who's this guy then? Hey, this is Jerry Ola, uh, CWNE number 238. If, uh, and uh, yeah, I am the product knight here at Ekahau, uh, at least according to our uh, marketing department that did a fantastic job with their Photoshopping skills. Yeah, knight in a semi shiny armor. You know, it's it's battle battle tested, right? You know, that's what we do on the product side here. We gotta battle test some things, so it, it's fitting. It's no beta. It's no beta, man. And for those of you who came here for the actual content, this is what uh, what Jason is planning to talk about, and and we'll give uh, you know give controls to Jason in a second. Before that, the mandatory. We have a really extensive training program. We're doing 150 trainings this year. And uh, it's taught by the industry's very best, including Keith Parsons and some of these other guys you may or may not have heard of. Please go to ekahau.com slash training for more information. The training is also available in Spanish, French, and, and German. Uh, anyway, this is something we uh, launched recently with Aruba as, uh, at the WLPC conference. It's Bluetooth coverage heat map, so it allows you, ESS upcoming 9.2 release will allow you to plan for Bluetooth coverage as well. So it includes AP integrated uh, BLE as well as BLE beacon placement and allows you to simply you know, design BLE systems that provide high location accuracy. Uh, this is big news for us at Ekahau, but small news for anybody else. Uh, so this is our new Helsinki office. This is what it looked like a day or two ago, and now it's starting to look a bit better by the day. Uh, then in case you're, uh, since you're here, you might be an Ekahau customer, and thus you might be interested in Ekahau products as well. I'm just going to show a, a, a really quick uh, demo of an upcoming feature. The Ekahau tool, and this is what we already demoed uh, briefly at, I think, Cisco Live at least. So uh, the, the, one of the features is called Cell Edge, 
which essentially means that I, I have brought in a floor plan from a CAD file, which includes walls and all that kind of stuff. And then I'm about to place an AP. So instead of having to wait for the scene strength coverage to, to update, I don't know, Jerry, how quickly does this update to you? But the idea is that, sorry? Yeah, it's looking looking pretty smooth on my end. Hopefully it's coming across uh, accurately or you know, real time for everybody else. But yeah, it's uh, it's pretty instantaneous looking. So, so what would you, Jerry, use this for? Well, I think for uh, you know, kind of a speed planning, right? So this is on the predictive modeling side of things, and we we need to define for a, a certain you know boundary of signal, and uh, you know that's a primary criteria that we're designing for. I think this is going to be really useful for our customers, uh, and this is obviously something based off of you know directly feedback and, and the feature request that we receive something for this kind of quick planning capability so you can visualize the, the boundary or edge of the cell and then be able to um, you know make sure you have adequate overlap but also make sure you don't uh, leave any you know corner gaps right in, in like the corners of the building like you're doing there exactly exactly and and uh, should this be called cell edge or something else that we're still debating we i mean we still have like a week to the product release so we <laughs> we can still make changes right yeah, nothing, nothing set in stone. So we're uh, we're we're taking uh, feedback on you know what this feature should be uh, should be titled as. So we'll uh, we'll see what we uh, end up with. Excellent, excellent. So that's just one of the things upcoming in the June, still June release. So this should be out. Yeah, I don't know, week or two or something. Um, Jerry, do you know the schedule? I mean, something like that, right? You know, tomorrow, next week, you know, something like that. Yeah, it's uh, it's coming up pretty quickly here. So we're, uh, you know, finalizing some of those details, putting all the, uh, you know, Q, putting the, the QA through its uh, paces here. But um, uh, yeah, in, in the coming weeks, right? So we're, uh, we're going to be pushing this new 9.2 update uh, pretty soon. Excellent. And then we have another pretty cool feature, which uh, we will have in experimental mode first so that we learn more out of it. And we've, we've used these experimental features before. For example, the height of the client device, we should uh, propagate the, uh, the signals for. So typically, if you press control and, and go to visualization options, you can uh, choose the visualization height. So this has been there for a long time as an experimental feature. So if you have four cliffs, which have PCs at 10 meters height, that's what you can do. But that's, that's old news. The new news, however, Jerry, what has been missing from our spectrum analysis functionality? Uh, I don't know. It doesn't make me any coffee. <laughs> <laughs> now, one of the uh, one of the, the number right on the money, sir. Yeah. That's why we hired you to give accurate CWNE level answers, right? That's right. Very technical answer, right? <laughs> No, the one of the biggest, you know, as soon as the sidekick came out, right, you know, one of the, the big requests that started coming in right away very, uh, very frequently was around, you know, all right, what is this interference? Now we have this great visibility into the RF environment, right? We can see that there's something out there that's not Wi-Fi, but, you know, it leaves me questioning what is this energy that's being detected now by the sidekick? Um, so, yeah, you want to talk about uh, what you're showing here? I, I guess it's pretty self-explanatory, and in, so, so it automatically detects the interferes or, or some of them, and, and we want to grow the database together with the community of the, of the classifiers or interferers. But the idea is indeed that, you know, I'm, I'm actually glad I'm on 5 gigahertz, because otherwise, I hope you guys can still hear me. Uh, and this happened in a previous webinar where I killed my Wi-Fi I was on. Uh, so yeah, that's that's kind of what it does, and we want to grow this feature with you. And uh, to enable it in 9.2, you essentially right-click on the Sidekick icon here, and then you say enable the experimental interference detection. So again, right-click here, enable interference detection, and then uh, in the full screen RTFM, you would go from no interference to show interference. That's how it works. It won't save stuff on the map but it will give you a feel for the feature uh, on how, how it works today. And it won't uh, show anything on the map yet. I don't know, it might be coming, who knows? I, I'm not allowed to talk about the roadmap. And actually, I already did for the last five minutes. So, uh, and Mikko is now, now uh, showing thumbs up and love, so, so he approved. Okay, so um, anyway, 
that's it from our side. Just a couple of features. Let us know what you think on the QA or chat board or anywhere uh, <laughs> as, as we switch to Jason. What do you guys think of the uh, upcoming features? And with that, Mr. Hintersteiner. Or uh, unless there's anything more for Jerry to show, uh, we're ready to uh, see the main star of the right. show. I think we uh, stole the show enough. We can uh, you know, pass the, the ball over to the, the, the main point of this uh, webinar, right? So yeah, Jason, are you ready to uh, share your screen? Yeah, let me see if I can uh, share my screen and uh, flip over. So Kick here. me out, man. Kick me Give out. Give me a second. Uh, so can you guys see the presentation? We I can. can. Excellent. Plus, we can hear your pleasant voice, Jason. Excellent. Um, so, uh, first, I want to thank Ekethau for the opportunity to present on Mesh. Uh, it's an honor to be here uh, with all of you, um, you and to shake it up and and make this topic a little more interesting. Uh, given the presentation, a uh, Hamlet Shakespearean theme, uh, which will become kind of readily evident. Um, now, I am not an expert. Uh, you know, in Shakespeare, and I am not a member of the Royal Shakespeare Company, but I will do my best. Um, but I certainly know quite a bit about Mesh, uh, which is the main topic of today's presentation. I'm the Director of Business Development at League of Wave Networks, and uh, if you have questions about League of Wave, please ask them at the end. So, to Mesh or not to Mesh? That is the question. And I'm going to start with a Hamlet quote on Mesh. To mesh or not to mesh, that is the question. Whether it is nobler in the mind to suffer the slings and arrows of tangled ethernet, or to take arms against a sea of RF, and by opposing end them to die, to sleep, to transmit no more, and by a sleep to say we end the RF interference and the thousands of dollars running cable is heir to, tis a communication devoutly to be wished. To die, to sleep, to sleep, perchance to dream of flowing wireless frames. Aye, there's the rub. For in that omission of wires, what data traffic may come when Ethernet has shuffled off this mortal coil? Mesh gives us pause. So let me start the presentation telling you a little bit about the Bard, myself. Uh, I am CWNE uh, number 171. Uh, I'm not going to focus on all of my credentials, but I will talk about my background in Mesh. Uh, because I am a seasoned veteran in mesh. Uh, when I got into this field in 2008, um, two weeks into my first job in Wi-Fi networking, I was sent to a mesh network in Sugar Grove, West Virginia, uh, in order to debug a mesh network that my company had deployed there that wasn't working properly. And for anybody who doesn't know where Sugar Grove, West Virginia is, you go smack dab to the middle of nowhere and then hang a left. That's where it is. Um, in the end, of course, it turned out to be an object lesson in self-interference because there was a lot of traffic and everything was on the same channel. And the more traffic you had, the more people trying to use it, the worse the mesh performed. And we'll get into a little bit as to why that happens a little bit later in the presentation. Um, I've also designed, deployed, and troubleshot dozens of mesh networks and mesh deployments over the last 10 years, uh, both in my role working for service providers uh, and then later in my roles in working for AP manufacturers. So I unfortunately know quite a lot about Mesh. My current role is the Prince of Business Development, uh, actually Director of Business Development at Lego Wave Networks in Canton, Georgia. Uh, and I will state that all of our Wi-Fi access points do support Mesh. So this is a technology that we do support. And uh, hence, I will give you the, the good, the bad, and the ugly about Mesh. Um, and in going with the theme of Hamlet, every slide in this presentation has a Hamlet quote or a slightly altered Hamlet quote. So, and it will try to match up with the message of the slides. So, oh God, I could be bound in a mesh network and count myself Emperor Wi-Fi of infinite bandwidth were it not that I have bad dreams. So, why does everybody like Mesh? Mesh is actually something of a little bit of a miracle because it's giving me Wi-Fi without having to run those pesky wires. Uh, and what Mesh does is that it provides Wi-Fi service to both clients as well as providing wireless backhaul eventually to some type of AP that's wired to your network. It will automatically calculate the optimal path through the network and it will adapt to changes, which means if one of those nodes happens to, to go down or fall off the network or move away, 
um, mesh can manipulate, it can basically readapt and come up with the next best path uh, to get back to the wired network. So, which makes it very robust because you could actually accept the failures of individual APs and still actually maintain your connectivity to uh, more remote nodes without wires. It is designed for large scale networks where wiring is impossible or cost prohibitive. What a piece of work is mesh, how noble in reason, how infinite in faculties, in form and moving, how express and admirable in action, how like an angel in apprehension, how like a god, the beauty of no wire, the paragon of backhaul. Now, for those of you who, of course, know the original Hamlet, you'll know that Hamlet's soliloquy here, he was being very sarcastic, and so am I. So let's talk a little bit about terminology. You have what are known as root APs and node APs. So the root AP is a conventional access point with the AP with a wire connecting it to a wired switch uh, to your infrastructure network. So this is typically a direct ethernet connection or a fiber optic cable. Um, it can also be, and this is very important, you can connect the root AP to a wireless point-to-point -point or point-to-multipoint bridge because those wireless point-to-point -point and point-to-multipoint bridges acts like a wireless wire. So from the perspective of the mesh root AP, it looks, it thinks it has a wired connection even if you're doing it over a point-to-point -point link on a separate channel. And that's really, really important when we get into how to actually design for mesh to be able to have that option in mind. You also have your node APs, which are your APs without a wired ethernet connection. Um, now you may have ethernet running to a PoE injector for power, but they don't actually have an ethernet connection back to your wired infrastructure. So in order to actually do the backhaul to the wired part of your network, it actually uses the wireless radio um, to establish a backhaul connection either to a root AP or if there are multiple hops to another node AP in the chain. Each wireless link for this backhaul is referred to as a hop. So you could have one hop, two hop, three hops. That's basically the number of wireless backhaul links that you're jumping from one AP to the next. Now I always recommend using dual band APs because with a single band AP, you need simultaneous wireless backhaul and client access. Um, whereas with a dual band AP, I can use the five gigahertz band for wireless backhaul and client access, and I can devote my 2.4 radio only for client access. And when we get into the design, you'll, you'll see when I talk a little bit about the history of mesh, you'll, a lot of it started off with single band APs, and you can see why the technology didn't, literally didn't go very far. Neither a node AP nor a root AP be, for node oft loses both itself and friend, and root dulls the edge of client performance. <clears throat> I mentioned before that mesh will calculate the best path uh, through the network and will adapt to changes in the environment, such as APs going offline. The algorithm is proprietary to every vendor, so every single vendor that supports mesh does it differently. Some of them do it wildly differently. The typical parameters, though, that you are generally optimizing includes things like minimizing the number of hops, because every hop is going to introduce latency and introduce a reduction in throughput. So you want to minimize the number of hops uh, between your, your node AP and your, your root AP. You generally want to maximize the signal so that you can get the strongest RSSI and therefore the best MCS rates between neighboring node and root APs. Uh, and you may also want to balance the load across APs. So if you have a lot of clients on one AP, you may want to actually have a, another AP take a less quote unquote optimal path um, in order basically to balance the load on what might be the stronger path, but, but an AP that has, that AP might have a lot of clients connected to it, or it might have a lot of other uh, remote node APs connected to it. So you may often want to balance the load to get over, improved overall performance. I should mention that these parameters, because it's an optimization problem, can actually conflict with one another. And this can often lead to counterintuitive and suboptimal solutions, which means that because I'm trying to optimize over multiple things, the solution that the network and the algorithms come up with, you might take a look at that as a network engineer and go, why the heck did it 
decide to route traffic that way because that makes absolutely no sense. But that's often what happens with these algorithms. There are more things in mesh optimization, Horatio, than are dreamt of in our philosophy. So of course, everybody always says that mesh lowers throughput and there's a lot of stuff out there about whether mesh impacts throughput. So let me tell you kind of the story on, on mesh and throughput. With a conventional wired Wi-Fi network, you are dedicating all of your wireless airtime to client access. And all of your backhaul is going out over the wired ethernet cable. So this is how a conventional Wi-Fi network operates. My radio is solely devoted to transmitting and receiving data back and forth between client devices. And all of my backhaul of all of that data for upload and download is going in and out over the ethernet wire. In mesh, I'm utilizing that wireless airtime for both wireless backhaul and client access because I don't have that ethernet cable. And as a result, I'm reducing both throughput and client capacity. And this is typically where the 50% per hop loss comes from because if the AP is spending half of its time interacting with clients and half of its time interacting back and forth with the next node AP in the chain in order to get data back and forth to the main network, uh, I'm literally losing 50% of my airtime per hop. The general rule, therefore, is to avoid mesh in performance critical applications because of that reduction in capacity and throughput. You really should only use mesh in scenarios where running Ethernet cable is unfeasible. Where, and by unfeasible, I mean it's either physically impossible or it's cost prohibitive. You should also only do it in environments where my performance is not critical. So I might need coverage but I don't need a lot of coverage. I don't have a lot of devices in that space. So the fact that I'm losing some throughput is really not gonna be a big deal. You cannot, sir, take from me anything that I will more willingly part with all, except my throughput, except my throughput, except my throughput. So, sorry, Jason, just to say <laughs> you're rock, man. You're playing rock. <laughs> Thank you. So let's talk about the, the ghost of mesh, uh, self-interference. Um, and uh, mesh radios in a mesh group, or sometimes what we refer to as a cluster, where I have root APs and node APs, in order for them to communicate, just like an AP connecting to the client, they all have to be on the same channel. So every time an AP intercommunicates with the client device, that consumes airtime for neighboring APs as well. So basically I have all of these neighboring APs and they're all on the same channel so that they can communicate with each other. But if I'm also using those to, to talk to client devices, then every time I'm interacting with a client device, I'm further creating self-interference for the neighboring APs. And that's going to result in lower airtime capacity and higher retries. Now, Many vendors will give you the option to solely devote the, the five gigahertz radio to backhaul only, as opposed to sharing uh, that radio with both backhaul and client access. And that's what I usually recommend to people to get around this because then uh, I'm still getting losses per hop, but I'm not spending my time trying to communicate with client devices on that channel. And in deference to ghost frames, which were brought up at WLPC, uh, I have incorporated the following quote from Hamlet. I am the ghost frame, doomed for a certain period of time to propagate the earth at night, while during the day I'm trapped in the fires of purgatory until I've interfered with neighboring APs. If I weren't forbidden to tell you the secrets of RF physics, I could show you RF interference that would slice through your soul, freeze your blood, make your eyes jump out of their sockets, and your hair stand on end like dipole antennas but mortals like you aren't allowed to see RF waves in the air. So let's talk about when mesh emerged in the early 2000s and why it failed. The original mesh APs, when they first came out, most of them were actually single band 802.11g access point. Later on, uh, the more expensive versions were dual band, 
uh, but they were dual band 802.11a and 802.11g uh, because so you had your your maximum uh, data rate, you know half duplex data rates of 54 megabits per second. And remember how mesh works. A mesh AP is going to spend half of its time talking to client devices and half of its time talking on the backhaul to the next mesh node in the hop. So that means that you're going to lose 50% of your throughput on the first hop. I'm going to lose another 50% on the second hop, so a total of 75%. Another 50% on the third hop, so 87.5%, and so forth. So when you had a maximum of 54 megabits half duplex data rate, which would typically give you a throughput an actual kind of data throughput of around 20 megabits per second maximum, assuming you had kind of nice clean channels and were reasonably close by and high SNRs. Quite honestly, it didn't take a lot of hops for, as Hamlet would say, the rest is silence because your throughput would drop so low after two, three, four hops that the service became practically unusable. Now, for those of you who may be familiar with Hamlet, you'll, you'll know that there was a play that came out in the 1950s called Rosencrantz and Guildenstern are Dead, uh, which was a, uh, took a look at two very minor characters in Hamlet um, and explored their story within the story of Hamlet. Um, and I have taken this quote uh, from the very end of that play. Uh, there must have been a moment at the beginning where our backhaul could have been wired. Somehow we missed it. Well, we'll know better next time. I should mention right after that line was said, Rosengrantz and Kildenstern were hanged. So hence the tragedy. So if mesh was such a bad idea then, why is it such a hot topic now? Um, especially in the home Wi-Fi space? Um, it turns out that the technology actually meets the need for home networks. Now, you know, we've come a long way in the last 10 years and we now have 802.11ac on the five gigahertz. And when you're deploying in a home, right, the 802.11ac throughput is usually much, much higher than the bandwidth that's actually coming into the house. So even if I have a 100 by 10 cable circuit coming into the house, right, with an 867 half duplex data rate, I've got some room to play. So if I'm, if I'm losing 50% over a hop or two, I'm still generally okay. So we're, we're generally more tolerant of those losses. Plus, the networks are small. So we're not talking about a lot of APs. In the 2000s, everything was, there was a big push for, for deploying entire cities and metropolitan and downtown areas using mesh. Um, here, you're talking about three APs in a house. Um, so it's very easy to install because I don't need to run cabling. All I have to do is plug it in. Um, many vendors have also made this even easier to configure by, by using Bluetooth and basically downloading an app to your phone and just configuring the APs on, off your phone. Um, many vendors sell this in the three pack. That's very common to see amongst multiple vendors. Um, and typically you would configure this as one root node that's plugged into your cable modem and two mesh nodes that are elsewhere throughout the house. So you're really only talking about one hop and at maximum two hops uh, in the area because for a small coverage area like a private home, I don't have to worry about scalability. Mesh broke down in the 2000s because it didn't scale. Um, and even though it supports higher speeds now, of course, our expectations for how much data we're pushing have also increased over the years. But in a small coverage area, right, I don't need to worry about scalability. The fact that it only, I can only support three or four APs, yeah, that's actually fine. So the home mesh be madness, there is method in it. That said, the fundamentals are always fundamental. So when you do mesh, you are still sacrificing user capacity and data throughput. Your, your five gigahertz, of course, is going to attenuate faster through things like walls and people and furniture and so forth. So you may not always be able to get those MCS9 rates. So you need to be very careful about how closely you place them. Generally, when you're meshing at five gigahertz, you got to place the APs closer together than, than you would at, at 2.4. The typical data throughput performance in reality turns out over a mesh network turns out to be roughly 25 megabits per second. That seems to be the, the general case. Some people get better, some people get worse. Uh, but what I've seen in several scenarios is typically if you run a speed test over a mesh network and you have say a hundred meg cable line coming in, you're typically really only gonna get about 25 megabits per second. Now that's perfectly adequate for, for many home applications. You can stream you know, high def Netflix over that. You can't stream four or five of them over that. 
but you can you can you can still have very decent performance at 25 megabits per second. Um, however, in demanding household, households, um, say you've got every you know you've got four people streaming four different Netflix movies all at the same time, yeah, 25 megs is probably kind of pushing where you're going to go. Um, uh, furthermore, right, you you don't have any robustness built in for the flood of IoT devices that are coming on board and all the smart home devices and Alexa and Google Home and, and everything else that's uh, coming into our houses. So if you're already kind of borderline in terms of performance, even though we, each one of those individual devices doesn't take up a lot of bandwidth, as I start adding more and more devices, you're gonna be adding more overhead to the network, more, more traffic on the network, and, and your mesh networks are just gonna be less robust. So it's a little more than meh, but a little less than mesh. Now, one of the other funny things that happens in our industry is standardization because there is this pipe dream out there that I'm going to have different vendors mesh APs talk to each other. And it really is a pipe dream. Um, in order to enable inter-vendor communication. Uh, this was first envisioned back in 2006 with the IEEE 802.11s standard. And the Wi-Fi Alliance just this year uh, put out an easy mesh certification uh, to basically saying that, well, if all vendors are following this, this easy mesh specification, then you can mix and match uh, APs from different vendors and still get them to talk over mesh to one another. Now, coming from the vendor community, I have no interest in supporting having my devices talk to other vendors' devices. I want you to use my devices. And every other vendor would basically tell you the same thing. Now, there are open source algorithms for doing mesh. Uh, one of the popular ones is called Batman, a uh, better approach to mobile ad hoc networking. Uh, there's also hi hybrid wireless mesh protocol, which was what the 802.11s standard was based on. Uh, there are a few others that are out there. Again, the reality though is that every vendor, vendor does mesh differently, right? The algorithm tuning, so, so what, remember I told you right on the optimization, I'm optimizing over different parameters. I've seen as low as two, I've seen as high as about 100 different parameters that you can optimize over and it really depends upon the vendor and how sophisticated they wanna be in mesh and how much mesh is a part of their, their strategic uh, marketing strategy, but every vendor does this differently and it's usually considered a trade secret. So they're generally not going to tell you exactly what they're doing. And as a result, every vendor is using a different set of parameters to optimize. So the idea of being able to standardize mesh across different vendors, quite honestly, is a pipe dream. It's never going to actually happen in practice. This above all, to thy own nodes be true. And it must follow as the night the day that canst not be false to any client. So I've been bashing mesh, of course, but sometimes, you know, you do mesh because you have to, because I can't run wires and it's the only way to get connectivity to certain areas. So, okay, when you have to deploy mesh, and I've certainly deployed mesh lots and lots of times, my advice to you is to do it right. So here's how you do it right. You wanna cluster your, your mesh APs. And by cluster, I mean, you're gonna take a property, it's gonna be all spread out. Um, your MDF is <laughs> un, almost invariably gonna be located in one corner of the property. Um, even if it's located in the center, that eases up things a little bit, but almost invariably, it, your MDF is often one corner of your property. And I'll show you an example of that in a few minutes of what that looks like. So, but you're gonna to wanna to cluster the mesh APs, which means that I'm gonna basically space out my root APs to be roughly evenly spaced out throughout the property. Um, so I'm gonna define certain APs as being root APs and I'm gonna make sure I get wired or point to point uh, wireless connections to them so that they can act as root APs. And then I wanna ensure that I only have up to four remote nodes that are nominally one hop away from that root AP. So what this means is that at least 20% of your APs are gonna be root APs and all your 80% of your node APs are nominally one hop away from the root. Now, the reason that we do this is so that if that root goes down, those 
remote APs, which are now isolated in space, can then start looking around for another node AP to connect to. And even in a failure scenario, okay, now they're two or three hops away. But if you start with them being two or three hops away, then in a failure scenario of one of those routes, now they're going to be like four or five hops away, and the throughput is going to go straight to hell. Again, in order to create those routes, you're going to want to have dedicated wiring or separate wireless bridge point-to-point -point slash point-to-multipoint backhaul links to create those additional root APs. And I'll show you an example of that momentarily. Now, when you do this, your backhaul channelization becomes extremely important. Um, so you need to actually turn off auto channel and, on the root APs and on your backhaul links if you're using point-to-multipoint backhaul and set them statically so that you maximize the amount of airtime that's available in the space. Because I want neighboring clusters to be on independent channels. So that will maximize the airtime. If I only had one channel for everything, then I've got an entire property with multiple APs and they're all on the same channel. And we're not running single channel architecture here. So that's gonna be a major problem from a self interference perspective. So when you do the channelization, you're gonna set each of your root APs and each wireless bridge link to a static and non-overlapping channel um, so that each mesh is on a separate, each mesh cluster is on a separate channel. You're then going to set all of your node APs to auto channel. And you do that because the node APs are going to be looking around and, uh, and they're going to be scanning the channels to try to find the nearest root AP. They'll hopefully find the root AP that you've designated for them if you've laid it out closely enough and they'll connect to the root AP that you want. If that root AP should happen to go down, then that, that node AP, you're not losing the entire cluster, you're just losing that one AP. And then those, those mesh APs, which are, those node APs, which are now cut off, are gonna start scanning around and they will find another node AP connected to another root. And now they'll be a couple of hops away. So, these are the general guidelines for, for when you have to deploy mesh and, and you need to design a mesh network. These are the general guidelines that you want to follow. Mesh, the undiscovered country from whose born no Wi-Fi engineer returns. So I'm gonna show you an example of mesh in an RV park. The MDF, as I mentioned, is in a corner of the property. In this case, it's in the lower right corner. And all of the little bubbles that you see here on the Google Earth map are access points. The lines in red are point to point slash point to multipoint links. And the colors basically represent those different mesh clusters that I was talking about. So for example, if you look in the lower left, uh, sorry, if you look in the lower right corner of the screen, you'll see I've got this kind of green group and then I've got this uh, cayenne group. Um, cyan group and nominally right I have a point-to-point -point bridge link going from the green root node back to the MDF on the left side of the screen uh, I've got a second point-to-point -point link going from uh, the cyan root uh, back to its again back to the MDF um, the other bubbles that you see with the lines there those represent the mesh links so you can see I've got four APs in each of those mesh clusters now let's say what would happen if, if that, AP, that green AP that's labeled G8-R in this picture, let's say that AP goes down. So I'm in a corner of the property and the, the one root node in that corner of the property goes offline for whatever reason. Those other four APs, the G81 to G84, are essentially cut off from the network, but what they will start doing is they will start looking around for other uh, root and node APs. Um, they'll probably connect to say G91 um, or maybe they'll connect to G62. Um, so they'll have a few options based on what they can see. And so now I might be two hops or even three hops away uh, from a, uh, a root node that's got a wireless point-to-point -point backhaul link back to your MDF, but I still can provide service in that corner of the property, even with that root node down, um, that service might be more limited, but I can still provide service. And in any type of failure scenario, slow is always better than off. So I'm always better off 
if I can provide slow service versus providing no service. Uh, and I'm showing here the APs that, that this design was done with for both the point-to-point -point backhaul links as well as for the, the mesh APs themselves. So this is easy, right? Maybe the emperor Wi-Fi doth protest too much, methinks. So let me give you some takeaway messages. Mesh is only appropriate in very particular circumstances. You only do it when you absolutely cannot run wires. It should be your, your last, it really should be kind of your last choice of things to do. So I absolutely can't run a wire. And secondly, it has to be in an environment where the performance of your network just isn't critical, right? I'm not gonna have, you know, 100 people trying to stream 4K video over that mesh link because I guarantee it won't work. But if it's an area where I don't have a lot of people and I'm not stream I don't really need a lot of bandwidth, mesh can work fine for that. Mesh involves compromises. So you're gonna compromise both user capacity because remember if I'm, if I'm gonna devote my five gigahertz radio to backhaul, then I can't use that five gigahertz radio at all for clients. So I can only have clients connect on 2.4. If I decide I'm going to have it shared, uh, then I'm gonna be compromising. Again, I can handle less five gigahertz clients than I would otherwise, and I'm gonna be compromising 50% throughput per hop. So anytime you use mesh, you are compromising the, the absolute capabilities of the AP. Again, in non-performance critical applications, you've got room to spare, and that might be a perfectly acceptable design solution. Designing for mesh is tricky, right? You gotta group your nodes and your roots into these small clusters. You've gotta carefully channelize your clusters. And you really should be dedicating one band, usually the five gigahertz band, solely to backhaul and not using that for client access because you really want to decouple the, the radios that I'm using for client access to the network and the radios that I'm using for backhaul access to the network. So the mesh network is the thing to capture the conscience of Wi-Fi kings. Now, if you want to design for mesh with Echo and with LegalWave, uh, do you have a project that requires mesh networking? Come talk to us. You could come talk to me at LegalWave or come talk to Jerry and UC at Echo and we'll get you squared away. Uh, you know, predictive modeling for mesh is the same as predictive modeling for any standard Wi-Fi network where you're going to see the compromises on your, on your five gigahertz, on your, your speed performance of those APs in terms of actual throughput. If you're walking around an existing mesh network site and you're, you're taking a, an active site survey, uh, again, the procedure is exactly the same as you would on an ordinary network, uh, but where you will see the differences is in terms of the throughput performance. But if you have a project that requires mesh, come talk to me, come talk to, to my friends at Echohow, and we can help you plan out your network uh, with predictive design modeling and best practices to deploy in your environment. So get V to a mesh network. And with that, I will uh, leave it there and I will open it up for questions. I hope everybody enjoyed my, my little Shakespearean take on mesh networking and uh, please ask away. Well, certainly, sir. I give you a little uh, clap there. Can we uh, ask, ask <laughs> for an encore? Is, is that uh, acceptable? Hmm? Can we ask for an encore to the uh, to the play here to, to continue it going? Uh, we'll see what we can do. <laughs> um, all right, but but the encore might be Macbeth, so you know that starts getting a little dark. But but sure. <laughs> Thank you so much, Jason. Uh, we have a, like a boatload of questions, and this Zoom webinar thing it has a chat board as well, which opened up a whole new like back channel. Uh, thing for this. Not not anymore do you need to go to Twitter uh, to, to also interact with us during the webinar. Okay. Uh, so so that, that was kind of cool to follow and then you got, you know, tons of praise left and right. And there's a lot of questions on the official Q&A board as well. Uh, Jerry, you want to fire at will? Yeah, we, you know, obviously this is a very popular topic. You know, I was trying my best to keep up with the questions here, but uh, yeah, I flagged a bunch of them here to bring up at the end here. So we'll try and get through as many of them as we can. And if you've got some questions, go ahead and get those uh, submitted now and we'll, we'll hammer through these over the next uh, 15 minutes or so. Um, so the first question here is around the 
um, talking about the nodes in like dual channel, um, mm-hmm. are they programmable? Uh, is it possible to serve both the backhaul and the client access over five gigahertz? So the answer is, is yes. And actually most, not all, but most vendors actually default to that mode. Usually if you want to devote the APs to solely five gigahertz backhaul only, you usually have to actually go in and make a configuration setting. Um, that's the typical default that I've seen across multiple vendors. Um, again, though, when you, when you are sharing, cli- when you are sharing five gigahertz access, both with client devices and with backhaul to the next node, you are compromising both on the number of users that you can carry on the five gigahertz and you are compromising throughput because that will lead to your 50% per hop throughput loss per hop. If you're devoting the five gigahertz network solely to backhaul, you're not losing that 50% per hop because that radio never has to talk to clients on uh, your 2.4 gigahertz radio is, is only talking to clients. But obviously if I only have the 2.4 radio talking to clients, then I'm losing client capacity. So either way you need to make a compromise. And the question is, do I want to compromise on throughput or do I want to compromise on client capacity or do I want to compromise on both? And that really is up to the scenario that you're designing for. Uh, But when you're deploying mesh, you need to be aware of the fact that not having that wire there means that you got to get something up. Excellent. Great answer. Very cool. Uh, Did you talk through tri-band radios at any point? Um, So I haven't seen mesh implemented yet on a tri-band radio because the tri-band radios are... Um, you know, typically they've got the, the five gigahertz low and the five gigahertz high. Um, I have not seen a vendor actually introduce, I'm not saying that they're not out there. I've just not seen it. Um, but in theory, you could use the five gigahertz high, for instance, for doing your mesh backhaul and the five gigahertz low for servicing clients. So yes, with a, with a radio... And there were, I didn't mention this in the presentation, but I know towards the end of the, of the met, metropolitan mesh days in the 2000s, uh, there were vendors coming out with like three radio and four radio APs that were 802.11a and 802.11g. And the idea being that those radios would be solely, de- right, that some of those radios would be solely devoted to backhaul in order to get around this 50% throughput limitation. So... Um, again, though, if you're using a tri-band radio, right, you're, you're going to wind up compromising quite a bit on what channels, it's going to make channelization even harder because you're going to get limited to what channels you can use for mesh and what channels you can use for, uh, client access. So, you know, you're, you're basically leaving yourself one to two channels on, on each of those radios. And, and that, that can make channelization very difficult if it's a larger project and you're doing multiple clusters. So you would really want, you know, a multi-band, I won't use the word tri-band, a multi-band radio where that third band is, is actually really something different. Um, maybe three and a half gigahertz, maybe 60 gigahertz. Um, and again, though, designing for all of that has its own limitations and its own bandwidth and, and so forth. Yeah, it's kind of a catch-22, right? Because if you're deploying mesh, that means you're using multiple radios in the environment, you know, as it stands. You know, that's the whole point of kind of mesh. So you're shooting yourself on the spectrum side of things and, uh, you know, yeah. you know not being able to reuse those channels. Quite honestly, um, when I run into networks like this, um, what I'll often recommend is actually doing point-to-multipoint backhaul to every single AP. And then it becomes a point to multi-point design challenge. Um, but where every, where you're not using mesh, um, but all of your wired backhaul is actually wireless over a, over a network of point to multi-point APs that, that are presumably on separate channels. Hey, Jason, there were a lot of questions. I'm sorry to bring this to a sales pitch again, but there were a lot of questions regarding, you know, how to do this in Ekaha and stuff like that. You, you mind if I just uh, steal the presenter rights for a second? Please, please do. By all to means. illustrate, uh, I am sorry for uh, for kicking you out. So, 
just to illustrate how, how, for example, you could do mesh planning. I have a uh, predictive file here of a, let's say, a fairly typical maybe a residential area where we have high, semi-high-rise buildings, like, you, you know, one floor, two floor, up to five or six floor. So we have defined those buildings as uh, attenuation areas of different height. You can see here, most of the buildings are 15 meters, whatever, and they have a high uh, attenuation value. So you do that by, of course, uh, just doing free-form attenuation areas where you then, uh, you know, put in the height of the buildings and stuff like that. Um, you know, there's ready-made materials like, you know, whole, these whole map things, foliage building, things like that. So I have defined some foliage here, here at 2 dB per meter, and, and then there's, you know, other stuff. Anyway, my, my point is now we're looking at how these APs bolted onto the sides or tops of these buildings work, for example, on, uh, on 5 gigahertz or 2.4. And this is at the client receiver height, right? But for mesh, I'm sure Jason and, and Jerry know better than I do, but I, I would imagine for mesh, it's often like from building to building, for example. So how do we visualize if this, you know, AP that's set at 70 meters height, uh, how does it work at the height of, uh, you know, 50 meters? Because we want to see where are the good locations at the rooftops, for example, uh, to do the next mesh hub. And if I, uh, and this is where the hidden feature that I showed you earlier comes in. So if you control click the, uh, hold down the control key, then click options. Here's a new selection here saying visualization height. And if I want to understand how it looks like on those 15 meter uh, rooftop buildings or, or you, you know, what would that be feet, 45 feet uh, rooftops, I would put here, visualize that for me at 15 meters height, press enter. And now we're seeing what those APs coverage looks like at the rooftops of most of these buildings. So again, control click on the options and visualization height. And then when we wanna go back, of course, to the client perspective, we, we would take one meter by default, or if you want to visualize how it would look like for the subscribers on the second floor of the building, I could put, let's say five meters here. How does it look like for, you know, all the subscribers that need client connectivity on the second floor of these buildings? That's how it would look like. So don't be fooled by the two-dimensional user interface. It's, it's fully 3D and you can do a lot of neat things with it, including some, some uh, mesh planning. And as I was asking uh, on the chat board as well, if you'd like more mesh optimized features to ESS, tell, let us know. Uh, first of all, would you need them? Uh, how often would you need them? Uh, what kind of features they should be? And would you be willing to pay for extra for them? Anyway, back to questions. Yeah. By, the, by the way, you see, that's a really cool feature. That, that, that is a really cool and very useful feature for deployments like this, especially when the, the mesh APs, because you would typically put mesh APs on a rooftop or, or you know, 15 feet, five meters up in, in an RV park or something, right, to keep them out, you know. So being able to know how the APs are seeing each other, you know, is, is one viewpoint versus how the, how the clients are seeing the APs. Uh, definitely makes a huge difference. Exactly. All Jerry, right, next we question. We, yeah, next uh, question here is why do the mesh APs need to be on the same channel um, for both, you know, especially if we're talking like doing this, um, uh, you know, backhaul and serving clients? Why does that need to be on the same channel uh, to make that work? In, well, because I mean, otherwise, how are the radios going to talk to each other, right? So, I mean, this is standard. At the end of the day, in standard Wi-Fi, right, both your transmitter and receiver have to be on the same channel in order to hear each other. And you could think of nodes as being client devices for, for the roots, is one way of thinking about it. Um, but at the end of the day, right, if, I'm, if I have any transmitter versus any receiver, they have to be on the same channel in order to talk to each other. And if I want my mesh, if I want all of my mesh APs to see each other, then they all have to be on the same channel. So it's just, just how Wi-Fi works. Okay. So this is why we, I generally recommend kind of breaking them up into clusters because then I could put the clusters on different channels and then I have more airtime that I can take advantage of, right? Yep. So within the cluster, they're all on the same channel, 
but between neighboring clusters, I'm, I'm not, I'm, I can basically create a barrier between the clusters in terms of airtime utilization. So essentially that root AP would define what channel that cluster is going to be on, right? In my that, that's that correct. Level. And then if that root AP goes down, because the mesh APs, the, the node APs are on auto channel, you know, as soon as they lose their connection, they're usually going to start searching for, right, the next best path, which will guide them to another root AP. So yes, you would set your root APs on a static channel, and you would set your, your node APs on auto channel. Excellent. All right, so next question we've got here is around antennas for mesh deployments, uh, you know, indoor, outdoor, omni versus directional antenna. Do you have any kind of recommendations around antennas for deploying a, a mesh network? So uh, typically, typically, typically most people do omni because you want to be able to see everything in the space. Um, if you're at the corner of a property, I would obviously do a sector antenna or something like that. Um, because I don't need any coverage right outside of, of the property that I'm covering. Um, you could use directional antennas on the APs, but you know, keep keeping in mind though that if you're also using that band for client access, you, you, it's the same set of antennas for both talking to neighboring APs and, and talking to client devices. So, uh, you know, so for the example that, that UC just showed, um, if I design my antennas, to optimally talk to neighboring APs, uh, chances are I'm suboptimally talking to my client devices that are at a different level. Um, generally, it's actually the opposite is what actually happens in practice, which is I'm picking omnidirectional antennas in order to be able to speak to the client's devices. Um, that could be anywhere, you know, in a 360 degree field of view around me. Um, and I mean, I need to use those same antennas to, to talk via, you know, mesh backhaul back to the network. Um, again, this is another reason why mesh is essentially a coupled design because I'm coupling the functionality of client access to the functionality of, of backhaul. So unless you're taking the radio and you're devoting it solely to backhaul, right, then I'm going to need to make compromises on the antenna because I really have to worry about my coverage needs for both client devices and for uh, mesh backhaul. So if you really want to separate them out, right, one of the things that I like to do is skip mesh and, and do everything, do the backhaul via point to point because now I have truly uncoupled the, the, the wireless access to clients to the access back to the, the main, you know, the, the backhaul access to the main network. But that, of course, means I'm adding an extra radio and I'm, I'm adding extra parts and it costs, costs me more and so forth. Yep. But it's a good, it's a great question. Yeah, and it kind of, I feel like this one kind of goes along with that about the antennas or I'm curious to see if it will. Um, is there a trick to getting nodes to associate with a single root AP? Uh, specifically, giving an example, we've had issues where nodes connect to the wrong root AP despite configuring a preferred root. Um, I'm wondering, like, from an antenna standpoint, is there maybe a solution there, a recommendation to uh, help uh, with that? You could. I mean, you know, again, every vendor's algorithm works differently, but typically they're trying to, you know, I mean, universally, most vendors are trying to balance the, you know, maximize the, the SNR, right? So maximize the RSSI between uh, one hop and the next, um, and they're trying to minimize the total number of hops. Um, they may be optimizing other parameters as well. I worked with a vendor years ago that specialized in metropolitan mesh. I won't mention who it is. Uh, it's not Lego Wave. It was somebody else. And um, they told me, their engineers told me they optimize over nearly 100 different parameters um, in addition to the two main ones that I mentioned. Um, they had it down to an art form. But as a result, you could wind up with these wacky solutions. And, and you're looking at it as an outsider going, why is that AP connecting to that node? Um, because it all comes down to, not, you know, at the end of the day, you know, if it's going to pick the network that's got the strongest signal and the minimum number of hops back to a root, usually. But if, you're, if you have a vendor that's optimizing over more parameters um, or who has a flawed uh, mesh algorithm in one way or another, you could get some very wacky results that are very non-intuitive. If you really want to kind of lock it in, then you would actually 
set the, and I have done this in a couple of cases, you, you actually set the node APs to the same channel as your desired root AP, because then it will only see its own cluster. Now the risk in doing that, of course, is that if the root goes down, those, those node APs are still stuck on that one channel and there ain't nothing around it, else around it on that channel. And, and now you're, you're really stuck uh, because now in addition to losing that root, you've lost the whole cluster. But if you really want to lock in this mesh AP, you know, this node AP is connecting to this root AP, then you statically assign the channels on both of them to be the same. Okay. Okay. Jerry, uh, what do you think? We are one minute past the hour. One, one final question. Yeah, did you have one uh, on DAC? I know we've got a lot of questions here that we haven't gotten to. Apparently. Yeah, there's so it's many good ones to, to, to <laughs> choose from. Hey, um, did we talk in depth about when to use 2, 4, and when 5 for the backhaul? Maybe you covered this, but I was, I was tuned out reading. Um, so, so there are vendors, actually, it's a good question because there are vendors who will um, actually give you the option of saying use the 2.4 gigahertz for backhaul versus using the 5 gigahertz for backhaul. You can use 2.4 gigahertz for backhaul. Obviously, you have lower total spectrum available, so your bandwidth is going to be lower. Um, so that's one issue with using 2.4. Um, the other issue with using 2.4 is remember what you're doing. At the end of the day, you want clients to get online, and I still have a ton of single band clients out there. Even some of the you know lower end smartphones that you could buy today are still 2.4 only, and all of those IoT devices are 2.4 only. So if you say, okay, I'm going to use 2.4 for backhaul and I'm going to use five gigahertz for client access, um, I've basically eliminated the ability to connect 2.4 clients. So, you know, and even if you're saying, okay, I'm going to use the 2.4 radio for talking to clients and talking backhaul, you're now just slowing down your network even further. So many vendors will let you do it. Uh, I would typically, you know, there might be a scenario where it makes sense, but I have not encountered it. You, you know, uh, one thing that comes to mind with regards to that is maybe if you have a lot of foliage in the way and stuff like that, that's when the connection is kind of flaky on five gigahertz and, and whether, you know, uh, rain on the leaves, snow on the leaves might make it even flakier. If you just yep. can't for sure penetrate all those obstacles on five, then, yeah, you know. You might break through on two, four. Yeah, so that, that might be a scenario where you might want to consider doing that. Um, you know, you might also want to consider using a chainsaw and cutting down some branches to improve line of sight. Um, <laughs> All right, yeah, so, yeah, I'm, I'm, I like that. That's a topic for another webinar, right? Yes, right. Well, that gets into our Macbeth discussion, so. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I did see one, I know we're over time. I did see one question here that, that looks really interesting about ODFMA. Because yes, sir. AX. Oh, I'm um, I'm hearing AX is dead already in my ears from you, man. Uh, yes, somebody got up in October and, and actually publicly said that at the CWNP conference. <laughs> I um, remember we, that. We won't say who. Um, <laughs> but despite the fact that I believe it, right, those products are going to be out there. Um, and so, what ODFMA will, you know, I haven't really thought about this. It's an excellent question. But what ODFMA is going to allow you to do is basically break your, your channel into subchannels. So in essence, um, it essentially would give you an additional radio um, because, right, if I'm saying, okay, I'm going to take an 80 megahertz channel and I'm going to devote, say, 40 megahertz towards backhaul and the other 40 megahertz to talking to clients, you know, I've, I've essentially added a, a third radio in there. So that would definitely help uh, from the, the throughput standpoint. Um, you know, obviously, though, I can't use the full 80 megahertz for, for backhaul, so I'm limiting the, right, ODFMA is not going to increase speed uh, in this case, right? It, so, because I'm, I'm now using a 40 megahertz channel for backhaul as opposed to an 80 megahertz channel for backhaul. So uh, you're already compromising on speed based on the fact that I'm using smaller channels. But, but it, it might be a scenario that works uh, for mesh to use ODFMA to, to do that. That's entirely possible. Again though, you're, again, though, you're still compromising on throughput because I got to use smaller channels. So you're compromising on throughput that way. 
however you do it, right, however you slice it, however fancy we make the technology, the fundamentals are still fundamental. So somewhere I got to make a compromise. Obviously, some compromises are going to be better than others, right? And for particular scenarios, some compromises might make more sense than others. And that's fine if that meets your requirements. The fundamentals are still fundamentals. Dude, you bring the fun to fundamentals. What can I say? So, uh, thank you so much, Jason, for joining. Thank you so much, Jerry. Thank you for so much to all the listeners. Uh, let's keep the conversation going. Uh, for example, on Twitter, of course, we will send a follow-up email and, and all that kind of stuff. But uh, the feedback has already been overwhelmingly positive. But we do apologize for not answering all the questions. We've run out of time, but let's keep the conversation going. You will find us on Twitter uh, as well as on LinkedIn. So, uh, yeah. Any, anybody who who has questions on this stuff, please feel free to to tag me at, at Emperor Wi-Fi, um, and I'd be happy to uh, you know try to answer those questions uh, on on Twitter and over the course of time as people ask them. So, you know, if you have questions on Mesh and how to use it, please feel free to ask me and ask other members of the community. Because uh, we are a resource uh, for you uh, in order to answer these questions. And the, the, if you're not on Twitter, get on Twitter because uh, that's where all the Wi Fi engineers hang out. And we're all very friendly and, and we may not always agree, but we're always willing to help. We're all friendly. I wouldn't go that far, but, well, but... You, usually. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, thank you so much. And and if you can't, you know, can't go to Twitter for whatever reason or don't want to, you'll find us on LinkedIn. So, you know, first name, last name on, on the search there and, and hit us up, connect and, and let's continue discussions. Okay. Well, thank you, Yussi, for, for having me. Uh, it's been an honor and a pleasure. It's our pleasure, man. I hope to do this again. Uh, we still haven't done that small, medium business webinar. So, so let's shoot for that. Right, Jason? Abs absolutely. We will definitely uh, talk about, about doing a follow-up on small, medium business design. All right. Absolutely. And Jerry, thank you for setting up uh, the Zoom system. I, I think it worked pretty flawlessly, huh? Yeah, we'll see. Uh, I'll, I'll keep an eye out for feedback on it, but uh, on my end, everything sounded good, looked good. So uh, yeah, hopefully this is a, a good solution going forward for our audience. Awesome. Thank you so much, everybody. With that, have a great evening. Jerry, how do we... Thank you, Yussi. Th thank you, Jason. Thank, thank, you, thank Jerry. you, everybody. Thank you, Jerry. Thanks, Jason. Uh, J Jerry, is the, I guess the recording is automatically saved to the cloud. And